One of the things scholars are really interested in knowing when it comes to the gender division of paid and unpaid work is why does it still persist? What are the mechanisms that mean that even as women enter the labor force in greater numbers, even as they progress up to like C-suite positions and so on, why is it that women are still doing so much more unpaid work than their male partners, and especially in married heterosexual families with kids? Uh, what I'll be talking about today is why unemployment is bad for gender inequality and linking that to what we are seeing happening in COVID, especially when it comes to the division of paid and unpaid work, which is really wreaking havoc on women's earnings and employment in particular. I'll be discussing my research from my book called Crunch Time, How Married Couples Confront Unemployment, where I studied relatively affluent dual earner married heterosexual couples in the US who were experiencing unemployment. It's a comparative study, so I, in half the sample, I had families with a man who was unemployed, and in the other half, I had families with a woman who was unemployed. The reason for this really is because unemployment is seen as a conceptually interesting, interesting moment, which scholars see as something that might jumpstart gender equality. The reason for this is think of something like, if you have um, a dual earner, heterosexual married couple, with kids, um, and you know that means that they both earn, and one of them loses a job. If that ma if it's the man who's losing a job and he's at home, then scholars think that might be a time when he starts doing more unpaid work at home, like more childcare, more housework, and that would mean that this kind of gender division of paid and unpaid work is really about economic reasons. What I found in my study was that unemployment simply means very different things for families where women are unemployed and families where men are unemployed. So some of the key things I learned were that for families with unemployed men, their unemployment is framed as this very urgent problem that needs to be rectified as soon as possible, even in cases where men had earned significantly less than their wives. And that solution for these families was seen as job searching, searching for a job and getting reemployed as quickly as possible in a comparable job to the one that the man had lost. The practical implication in the family of unemployed men were that men's time was protected for job searching. This, there was this idea that men would be job searching from you know, nine to five, the kind of hours that they might have otherwise spent in paid work, and it protected um, their time from things like housework and childcare. So what this meant was, in my study, while men were unemployed, they were not actually doing more childcare or more housework. That still remained the domain of their wives who, by the design of the sample, were employed at the same time because of this rationale of that men need to get employment as quickly as possible. So the first finding is really about time use, about how unemployed men and their wives thought about men's time use and where men should be spending their time. The other thing really was about the use of space in the home. What I saw with unemployed men and their families was that often these families would either build a new home office or upgrade an existing home office or sort of demarcate a separate space in the home from which the man could search for a job from because it really was seen as a full-time job. This is what I heard over and over again, that searching for a job is a full-time job uh, with unemployed men. The final thing was that job searching really is very emotionally fraught. What I mean by that is, you know, in the white collar job searching process, you're applying for tons of jobs, you're getting rejected routinely. It's very hard to keep your spirits up and to kind of sell yourself as this is why I'm the best employee, this is why you should hire me. And in that case, what I saw with unemployed men was that their wives were doing a lot of this kind of what we'd call emotion work of cheering the men up, of buoying their spirits up. Um, including at a time when the wives of unemployed men themselves were feeling actually pretty distraught, pretty concerned about you know, their financial well-being. They were worried about when their husbands would get re-employed. So they were spending a lot of um, emotional resources catering to men's emotional well-being at this time. So this is what I saw with uh, families of unemployed men. What I saw with families of unemployed women was that their income from their prior jobs was really downplayed. It was seen as, well, it would be nice to have that income, but this is not necessary. It's not necessary to build a lifestyle around. Now, this is happening even when women were the primary earners. I'll give you an example. So one of the couples that I interviewed were the Bucks, and these are all pseudonyms. Darlene Buck had earned about three times as much as her husband 
Larry did. But when she lost her job, Larry's response was like, well, you know, we can still get by on my income. But their whole lifestyle, living in a very sort of affluent neighborhood, going on these international and domestic vacations, planning an elite college experience for their one son, all of these were really predicated on Darlene's income. They could not really have afforded this by on Larry's income. But this kind of economic rationality, in a way, almost went out the window. What this meant was that women's time was not protected for job searching, as in the case of unemployed men, and it was not protected from unpaid work. Instead, there was this sense in these families that I interviewed and observed that unemployed women, because they were no longer contributing by bringing an income in, should contribute more by doing more unpaid work, basically taking over all the kind of childcare or housework, and that became entirely their responsibility. Keep in mind that these are women who, even before their job loss, had already been doing more unpaid work in the home anyway. So this rationalization for how women should be spending their time versus how unemployed men should be spending their time, very distinctive and not shaped by how much each person was uh, earning. Partly because, I, as I said, I oversampled for um, families where women earned as much or more than their husbands. When you look at overall trends in the US, less than a third of women earn as much or more than their husbands. So I oversampled for that primarily because I wanted to be sure that what I was seeing was vested in these more cultural ideals rather than economically rational behaviors as, as we would uh, consider them to be. With space, for instance, with unemployed women, what we saw happening was that they did not have this kind of extra home office or a separate space in the home to job search from, pr primarily because job searching was simply not seen as this important thing that women needed to be doing it was sort of and their job searching was really kind of squeezed in it was fragmented they're doing all this unpaid work and whenever they can kind of apply um, for a job that's how they were doing it it wasn't that their days were organized around job searching i think what my research has shown is how access to affordable and quality childcare is really necessary to have gender equality and to retain women in the workforce. What I've described with my uh, research on unemployment really is about how, for women, it's about trying to manage employment and caregiving to the point where unemployment is often um, experienced as a, as a sort of relief um, just because there are so many obligations of unpaid work. And I think we are seeing that during COVID-19 as well, where we know that, for instance, women have cut back on paid hours much more than men have. Women have also dropped out of the labor force because it's been so impossible to manage um, both paid and unpaid work during these conditions of national lockdowns, school closures, and so on. I would also say that the other thing is really about thinking about how to get men and women more equally involved in unpaid work. What we've seen in prior contexts is that social policies can be really good at catalyzing gender equality in terms of getting men to kind of do more unpaid work. So what that really means is that even when people want to be or behave in more gender egalitarian ways, often they can't because they don't have the institutional support, as for instance with childcare, to carry that out. In the absence of that kind of institutional support, they fall back on more traditional ways of managing household dynamics with women doing more unpaid work. The other thing that I think, this is, and this is a broader question that we need to think about, is really how central employment or paid work can be for organizing aspects of our life when paid work itself is so precarious and so uncertain. What I mean by that is, should uh, things like health benefits, should things like pension and retirement funds, um, all of that be tied to paid work, which is really um, diminishing for too many people.